This morning, the Lord gave me an understanding. A lot of things that God gives me, as soon as I get them, I bring them here. As soon as I get any kind of revelation, I bring them right here. And I bring them here because many of you have been looking for the truth. And God gives me things so that you could hear it and understand it for you. And uh, although I, I gained greatly, <clears throat> there were two different things that I wanted to discuss this morning. And one of them was about uh, prayer about how you pray, which I prayed for everybody yesterday. And I said to you that Paul the Apostle got it right. Because if you take a look in the Word, <clears throat> Paul the Apostle would say, Peace and power and glory and honor to every soul that doeth good. And so he was praying. I'm sure he knew thousands of people as he traveled. And he was praying what you might call a blanket prayer. And he wasn't praying for just anyone. He was praying for those that do good. This is very important, okay? Because it's not like sending prayer requests into a ministry when you know you're not in the right place to receive it, but you send it in anyway, and then they take it, and they lay hands on it, and they pray for your specific prayers, which when you get thousands and thousands of them that is near impossible in the sense that the person who is praying they have no idea where that person is at they have no idea what they've done what they've said so their prayers is touching lives to enable them to do continue in the wrong continue in the problem uh they are helping them by their prayers to get specific. You know, I had even said, what good does it do for you to have your body healed and you still go on in the same evil and then something else worse comes upon you? Then you're going to need prayer again and whatever. Um, but Jesus, he put out specific examples of prayer in two places. And and those where someone consider them can consider them a blanket prayer. You see, God knows your specifics. He also knows that all of us are tempted and go through almost almost the same things only in the realm of our world. He he knows that. And so he knows all of your needs before they're even spoken. So there are passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, that speak about how uh, Paul prayed for the church. He didn't, I don't see in one instance, where he got on his knees and talked to Satan and said, I bind you, you can't come here to this church, you can't do this. No, that came from man. That did not come from God. Because you do not ever first talk to Satan. Why would you want to talk to the enemy to stop him from coming someplace? He has no right to come and he's not allowed. I told you when he sees the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life, he goes, huh, he can't touch it and he knows it. But he can go, oh, well, they don't believe God. So I'm, I'm entitled, God. You know, look at that. He or she, they don't believe you. They really believe I can do this. So I know that by your permission, I have the power to do this. I can do harass them however I want. I can do whatever I want because they don't believe the truth of your word. Now, he communicates with God these things, whether you believe it or not. He does. He lets God know. He knows where and why he can touch you. So he goes and he lays his hands and you think it's illegally, it's uh, where he has no right. But you've given him the right because you believe that he can. Okay, you give your life to God. You don't spend the time that you need to to be sanctified, to get before God and talk to him about every, all the things you used to do. Get everything that you ever thought, felt, or did under the blood of Jesus Christ. That is sanctification. 
to die to yourself, that is set apart to be made holy. But you don't do that because you're not taught that. You are trusting completely in what other people tell you and what other people teach you. You're not going according to what God teaches. And God doesn't teach you that. He doesn't teach you that the enemy has power over your body, mind, or spirit. He teaches you that he covered you with the blood and the blood heals and delivers and does all the operations it needs to do. And when you ask God to forgive you, you're covered with the blood. And then you ask God to come into your heart and mind, which is Jesus Christ, and to open up the eyes of your heart and give you the power and the wisdom to understand how to pray, how to think, how to feel, because you want to usher out the old man. You want to usher him out of your life. And you don't usher him out by saying, Satan, I rebuke you. I bind you. You can no longer touch me. God has me. That's You're talking to Satan. You're not talking to God. You are automatically at first conversion, conversion talking to Satan. He's gone. When God covered you with his blood, he's gone. But here's what happens. You invite him back in. And by believing that he can mess with your mind, mess with your family, mess with everything, it is invite to him, an invite. He, he goes before God and he says, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ is not covering you anymore because in a one-time experience of washing your garment, now you're still in the old man and you're still sinning. And you're still doing things that you know are wrong, but it'll be all right. God will take care of it. It's okay. Got it. And so you have opened the door for this, whatever this is, for the two different things to exist. So somebody teaches you how to study demons, how to ask the demon to come out, how to, everything that I have ever heard when I talk to people in prayer is demons, demons demons uh it, you know it's, well, i'm sure she's filled with demons or i'm sure that i'm filled with demons you know when you give your life to christ every demon in hell goes whoosh, please so why are you still harassed and why are you still troubled it has to be your lack of understanding. And you see, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding have all they that fear the Lord. So if you have no fear of God now, because you think, well, hey, I'm covered. I've, I've got it now. I'm on my way to heaven. And you have no thoughts whatsoever about what you think, say, or do that can take you to hell that can lead you to the wrong thing. Well, but I had that straightened up with God. I, But you're still doing them. You still think the same way. You still feel the same way. You still act the same way. You still talk the same way. And in your mind, but that, hey, but this is salvation now. I, I've got it made. I, I have salvation now. I can do whatever I want and still be saved. Once saved, always saved. I can do that. What? Why? My this pastor preaches it and told me that's the church I go to. Uh, she told me that I can do this. Well, it's not true. The truth of the matter is, is it's up to you and your responsibility to get rid of the things that you used to do. I'm not telling you to get rid of the devil because if you got rid of the things you used to do and you worked it out with God, your your salvation with fear and trembling, you would never have the devil knocking at your door. And and he only knocks at your door, like God said to Cain, sin lieth at the door. Well, he's at your door, and he's at your door through your ignorance and lack of understanding on how to pray, how to think, how to feel. You haven't been taught that. Well, some people will take you aside and put you in a room and just submerse you with the Holy Spirit and just, and I'm not telling you this Holy Spirit does not come because he does. But when he submerses you, if he knows you don't have any understanding for what you're doing, they don't have any understanding for what you're doing. So you get submersed and then it lifts because you're still 
in the same old, same old. He has to lift. You call him, he comes, and then he has to lift because you are still thinking like the old man, feeling like the old man, li like, uh, lying like the old man, doing all of those things. So this is what I think in my book I said, I called people stillborn. In other words, they come to come out of the womb, but they're born dead because they don't know what life is all about. Now, it's not their fault that this happens, except to their submission to untruths. Their submission to things that they've been taught for years, doctrines that are not true. And that is where you come out stillborn. Because if you looked into the word at Jesus Christ, you would see how he thought and prayed. You would see how Paul the Apostle prayed, how others prayed. They didn't pray specifically against everything. There is even in the Acts of the Apostles, there were specific circumstances and situations that God gave permission for it to be done that way. But he did it with when he the demons were manifested. It wasn't everybody that had that problem. Everybody had demons, of course, because every uh, evil spirit against God is demonic. But he didn't tell everybody. He didn't say, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. He didn't say when they were slapping him and, and telling him all kinds of things and, and uh, making the truth a lie. He didn't say, well, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. You devil. I rebuke. He didn't do that. He quietly died for your sake. Quietly kept his mouth shut because he knew and understands stood things that you don't understand. So now if you sit down and you say to me, and I can feel it, and some of you say, well, I'm confused. I don't understand what you're trying to say. Well, if you wait for a couple of minutes, you will. You will completely understand. Uh, the power to get the enemy off of your life, the life of your children, the life of your spouse, that power was given to you. Not to your pastor, not to the next door preacher or teacher. It was given to you to do your homework to seek out how God wants you to think and feel. But if you never go into the word and find no pleasure in it, you can't see it. You can't, you can't understand. Okay. But he gave a perfect example with the Our Father prayer. You know, uh, a pastor would do better to talk to God, not, not pray it like a dead ritual, our Father which art in heaven. That's a dead ritual. It has no power. It does nothing. But when you go to God knowing you're going to go, oh, Father, you're in heaven. You're holy. When your heart says all those things, believes all those things, walks in all those things, now you are touching communication with God because you're telling him, you're not repeating, you're not believing, you're being heard because you repeated a prayer that Jesus gave an example to pray. He gave that example so you could learn how to take that prayer apart with him and how to hear his voice speak to you. Thy kingdom come. Well, if you understood the word and you read it like you were supposed to and did your homework, you would know and understand that the kingdom comes in you. Now, how can the kingdom come in you when you're filled with you? You refuse to take the time to be sanctified and holy. You refuse to believe that you need to clean the old man out. You refuse to believe that you need to get him out of here and out of here. So how can the, his kingdom come? So it winds up a ritual prayer, a prayer. Well, it's a repetitious prayer. It's a prayer that we all have to pray. This is not so. This is not true. This is not what Jesus Christ intended when he gave this. He gave it so that you would ask God and you say, Lord, because all of us who are sinners, all of us who got saved, are tempted to the same thing. We're tempted not to forgive. We're tempted uh, to to uh, 
to do a lot of different things. And it's all written right there. Forgive us for our trespasses. Now, they they wrote it debts. They made it into debts. Debts don't even begin to describe trespasses. Trespasses is when you trespass upon another person's territory, another person's home, another person's thoughts and feelings and emotions and everything about them. You trespass and you touch them and you say, make them do this, make them do that, trouble them till they do. You, you control. That's You've trespassed onto a property that you did not buy. You trespassed onto a tra- property you did not pay with your blood for that other soul. And I'm talking about the brethren. I'm not talking about the world because the Jesus, the Lord said that he will judge the world, that we are to keep our eyes and hearts and minds on focus on Jesus Christ in our life so that we can do what he says. Because when we see that someone in our church has sinned, everybody starts yapping and gossiping. Well, you know, she did this. Oh, her, she, he did that. And I know it. I saw it with my own eyes. God revealed to me how horrible a person these people are. God should. That's a bunch of gossipy lies that goes out into the air and destroys and Jesus Christ told his own disciples. He didn't come to destroy. He came to save. In another place, he tells you, why in the worst sins, why are you acting the way you're acting? Why are you not crying? Why aren't you mourning because your brother has sinned? Why aren't you you in a place where you can say and, and consider the fact that you may be taken next. That could happen to you. But no, pride raises up. Knowledge is so puffed up. Understanding who I am. I am so-and-so, and I am a Sunday school teacher, or I am a deacon, so I'm above that. No, you're not. Sin is sin, and you're not above any of it better than anybody else. You're not more than anybody else. And God did not call you aside for you to sit in Lord over people, for you to Lord over them in their prayers. Make them Lord God. Cause them and stop them and do this. No. You cry out for mercy, for God to come and lead them to repentance and help them to find the way. That is what God is after and that is what God is about. But people don't do that. They've been taught differently. Well, if you're a Dinkin, you're something very special. Even if you are in a church, you've got this because you're so special. Oh, but those that clean the latrines and clean the bathrooms, they're nothing. They're just garbage. Look at them. thats They crawl around on the floor and clean all the dirt. So, you know, they're nothing. And God says they are more worthy than you that have the menial jobs. It's just like the man I told you about. His wife would uh, cut up the wood and get it ready for the retreat on the fireplace while he was running around praising the Lord with all these women that were telling him from reading books that his wife filled with demons. And she's the only one cooking and working and laboring to keep everything clean and right for the, for the uh, retreat. And the pastors, they supported him and lifted him up. They didn't lift her up. They could see her face was clearly swollen from him beating her. They could see that she was down like this, thinking she's nothing, very humble, thinking she's garbage because he proved it to her that he's everything. So he proved it to every single pastor that ever laid hands on him. And as far as I know of, when he went into the grave, those pastors gave him all the money, all the things that he needed to build up his ministry. Never mind that he was called to work with boys. And when he called, was called to work with boys, those boys never grew up. They could not. He used them as slaves and he used them and treated them as boys. So when you come in contact with them and they were 32 years old, they were not a man. They were a boy. And you wonder, what what in the world? You knew the man was called. I watched it. I watched it on a video that the spirit came down and called him. But look what he did with it. 
because lack of understanding and ignorance of what God is all about, oh, it unleashes Satan in churches that you would not believe is real. So you get pastors that puff themselves up. Well, I went to Bible college and I went and studied here. And why I fasted for six weeks and I fasted for 10 weeks. And now I'm closer than I ever was with God. Are you? Are you now? Do you have the wisdom to know how to teach and preach to someone to bring them out of the things that they are doing to themselves through ignorance? Are you wise enough to understand? Do you have the fear of God enough to turn away from your wicked works? Because he said the time is going to come. You're going to say, uh, wouldn't we, didn't we do many mighty miracles? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we heal the sick? And he's going to say, get away from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you because you sit in a high place where nobody else has it. And you even have the gall to tell them if they follow this scripture and give you a thousand dollars or give you ten dollars, even if it's ten or five or two, that you have the power. That because you have all the wisdom that God can give because you sing to him every day and he gave you this voice and he gave you everything. I am telling you, I am telling you, repent of those kinds of works because God loves his children more than you think that you've played for years. How many of you played for years? And then you suddenly come to a place where I know it's wrong to sell the gospel and I'm going to rebuke anybody that does it because I have the authority. I know how to edify the church. Do you now? Do you know how to lift up that soul that is so downtrodden and, and edify it to bring it to a place where it can walk and talk with God with all the grace and power that it needs. Do you know how to do that? Or do you know how to use it to get your money, to get where you want to go, to get where you say God is leading you? Which, which one are you? You know, like I told the young man when he uh, got really blessed with, with the ability to be able to, uh, to, to be able to to uh, reach other souls. And a young girl, beautiful young girl, comes along and sits in front of him, and she sees the wisdom of God inside of him, and she falls in love with it. And he can feel she is, in the natural, looking towards him like that. And I told him this. I said, now you're coming to where the rubber meets the road. You're coming to the place where you have to decide, are you going to look at her? Because you're in your 30s. Are you going to look at her as someone's little girl? Are you going to look at her as a baby sister? Are you going to see her like that and protect her and make sure that she gives up these foolish little things and realizes that it's not you, it's Jesus Christ she's seeing? Are you going to lead her to Jesus Christ? Well, fortunately for this young man, he made all of those decisions. I was only confirmation. I was only someone who let him know and confirm the truth that God led him that way that he would never take advantage. Because I said, you know, there are men who take advantage of that. That's why you see the pastor run off with a Sunday school teacher or run off with this one, because they're after pleasure. They're not after anything else but their own pleasure. If you if you tell someone that you, you can sell the gospel and God gives you that permission to sell it, that you will have this if you listen to me. You will have that if you listen to me. That's your own thoughts and feelings and pleasure. And because you have God's name on it, and it seems like you had him for years and you had so many followers, repent. Repent and do it rightly. You were called to do it right. You weren't called to play these kind of games. You weren't called that this doctrine is, is true. You could murder somebody and still be saved. That is not how you preach and teach the truth. You don't know how many people you are responsible for, young people that have listened to you, that go out there and when they're tempted to do wrong, they say, well, it's going to be all right. Jesus says, he will, he will save me. I'm saved. 
And once saved, always saved, I can do it. Well, it doesn't matter if I rape that girl. It's okay. It doesn't matter if I uh, mutilate somebody. It's okay. All because you felt this is God. He says this. You take the scriptures out of context and you take them where it says, once you take a step towards the spirit of God, once you start and going after the spirit, you walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Then God says, there's no, therefore no more condemnation. But the moment that you dump that and you go after the flesh, guess what just happened? You denied God in everything, and now you're after the flesh. There is, there is conviction for that. There is a consequence for that. But all of this gets like a, a twisted up, and, and it's, and then you wonder, well, well, why, why don't I have this? And why is that happening? And why? Because God has gotten to a place where he is fed up. His church is dying and it has been dying. When he came to me and told me this, he said, I can't even talk to them. They've been told that if it's not comforting, if it warns them, it's the devil. He says, so I come to convict them so that they'll repent of this so I can bless them. He says, but they'll say, get away from me, you devil, because that preacher, or that teacher had the gall to preach untruths. And you know why they do that? Because they don't have it themselves. Oh, but they're famous and oh, they're so what? And you foolish people that you go after that. Don't you realize God is nothing to play with. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And when God comes to visit, and I guarantee you he's coming to visit, and when he comes to visit, he's going to check out if what he heard about you is true or not. He's going to check out, are you preaching and teaching the word of God, the truth in it, on how to set people free in their hearts, in their minds, and in their lives, and in their families? Are you preaching and teaching that without charging them, without asking them for money, without uh, demanding it from them? Because some of you demand it. I mean, like I said, that one, that one preacher that had a college, and he taught how many famous preachers. And at college, he wrote a letter that I personally read that said, if you don't give me your whole social, social security check, God is going to kill me. And that 80-year-old woman cried and cried because it was her whole living. But yet, he had the gall to write that letter. And, and I wasn't even saved when I saw it. And even I knew then it was wrong. But that is what they t can teach you even when, even when they went out into Africa and they taught them how to get money off of the Americans. Oh, go to the Americans. They're all they have and take complete advantage. Go into Mexico and say, God's going to split America in half and give half to Mexico in half. No, God didn't do this operation. You did. God didn't put certain uh, people in office that had dumped out the truth in courtrooms, dumped out the reality of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. Somebody come along and dump that with your permission and with your help. And you say, well, what can I do to change? Well, repent of it. Repent of it and quit letting people like that into office. Pray with all your heart that that people, you ask God to forgive you first. Ask God to work it out. Why would you pick up such a thing? Why would you do such things? Because there's flesh inside of you that refuses to die because you won't die to self. So I want to go back to the, the two different prayers. The one prayer is where he prays for God to God the Father to bless his food. You know, uh, where it, there was an increase, I thank you, O Father. That's how he starts out. I thank you. And, and, and when he does this, when you thank God for your food and you do that, 
It's not a repetition prayer every day, the same thing. It's not that. It's the heart that thanks God for what you have. And when you bless it, I have seen it at my own table where my husband and I at the time did not have enough. We had very little. And as I looked at it, I wondered how it was going to be spread between the two of us because I know him. What he'll do is he'll give me the bigger part. But what I'll do is I'll give him the bigger part. And he doesn't want me to sacrifice and I don't want him to sacrifice. So I'm sitting there and I pray over the food and the next thing we know we we have it turns into like a bank banquet right in front of our eyes. We have so much that we have leftovers. We're both marveling and saying how wonderful it is. The same exact thing. We had so much more. So when I go to before God, I say, I thank you, O God. I don't say, Lord, will you do this and increase this? Will you? you know, uh, it's people who repeat prayer after prayer. When you invite God into your heart and mind, he comes. He comes and he changes you and if he hasn't done that then you yourself has stopped him from the changing it's not the church's fault it's not the people's fault it's your doing we're not talking about what these people did so that you could get your eyes on them and focus well they did this they're going to pick that's none of your business i'm only trying to explain to you what happens when you're not in the right pew and how people, uh, uh, they go the wrong way. Get your eyes off of them. I'm not talking to you about them. I am trying to waken them up also and help them to see the error of their ways. Not to have you focus on them because you're doing the same old, same old flesh. The same old, same old, old man. The same old, you can't get your eyes so and so. Like the one woman who's done the worst things in a person's life. The gossip, the prayers, my goodness, the power of the control of Satan to reach into a life that she believed deserved every bit she got. That's, that was her, her heart and mindset. As bad as that is, she deserved it. She's going through this because she deserved it. He's going through that because they deserve it. So she, she goes before God and says, well, I was so wrong about this life. Please forgive me. But she says, I just can't help it. I can't help it. I can't. It bothers me what people do. It bothers me that so-and-so did this and so. Shame on you. Shame on you. What? How dare you be troubled and bothered over what you think someone else has done when you did the worst. You took your children and you gossiped with them and turned them against a person that was innocent compared to what you knew and understood, who knew nothing about the Bible, who knew nothing about God when they made their mistakes, but you couldn't let go of it because it's so horrible. It's so terrible. It destroyed this for you and destroyed that for you. It's so, I am telling you, repent. Now you've grown your children up and they've told their children all the filthy, dirty, rotten lies. Because somebody came to you and wanted to look better than what they were. So they told you a bunch of lies and you fed on it and you fed on it and you gave it out and you gave it out. But now you're in a possession that you're getting position that you're getting older and you're going to have to face God. So what do you do? Well, I just can't put people if I'm not as good and as kind as you. I can't be like that. How dare you look at anybody and not know that Jesus died for them the way he died for you. How could you look at them and hold it? You want to know why your body is tormented? It's filled with different diseases where you can barely walk. You can barely this. That's why. Because you're given up to the tormentors as written in Matthew. You're given up to, to because you refuse to forgive people for doing things that you feel you sit high church you have you are high in church and you are able to judge them 
let me share something with you. If you're not a prophet, you can't deal with sin like that. Only a prophet can stand there and rebuke this one and this one with all long suffering. I'm not even talking about a pastor. Because when a pastor puts forth his hand, he had better have it to the core. He had better have what he is claiming he has to the core. Because if he doesn't, God will visit it. God will change. There's no fear of God within them where they can actually sit down. They can actually get people to give to them and, and tell them, well, I need money for this and I need... The only God I've ever known is the one that I tell God that whatever my needs are, I trust him for them. I don't go to you and say, well, I need this and I need that and I'm going here and God's going to give and why don't you do this and why? I, I don't do that. Once in a while, the Lord will lead me to mention that I'm after books, doing books. That's, that's not the same thing. I might say that in case there's someone out there that wants some of my books and wants to see them more. That is what I'm after. I'm not after getting more money. I'm not after getting this. I'm not after getting that. Oh, I wouldn't freely give you everything freely if I was after your money. I wouldn't freely give you everything if I was after your support and your lifting me up and you're I don't want lifted up I don't want you to look at me as though I'm something so special because the truth of the matter is you are because God died for you and even that woman that has done these atrocious things and is sitting in judgment of others Jesus Christ died for her and if I could t sit her down here today and you, she would listen to me, I would tell her the truth. I do not compare myself with these pastors or preachers and look above as though I am so high. I don't know what caused them to do what they did. I'm not judging them nor condemning them. I'm only saying things to give them an opportunity to look at things as they are in their life. And if they're pure, clean, and holy, and they know they've done the best they know how to do, then God bless them. God strengthen them. Blessed, blessedness to every soul that does good. Does good. But people can take out of context whatever I'm saying and apply it to someone else and run with it. That's not God. You're doing exactly what they have, the church has done over and over and over and over. And that's where the church doesn't get anywhere because they go, look, oh, you know, oh, and they never go. Oh, look, look what I've done. Oh, oh look what's in here. Oh, the, oh, oh what am I going to do? They don't do that. They don't go before God and say, oh, God, according to your word, I'm going to hell. According to the truth, my, my life, I'm headed for hell. That's what I did with God. I went to God and said, oh, God, according to your word, my tongue's going to take me to hell. I'm doing things wrong. Oh, God, help me. Save me from hell. And he did. He delivered me. That's how you get delivered, is you break fellowship with believing it's okay. You have to break fellowship with believing what you've done is right. But you don't do that. You stand there and say, I'm right. I know I'm right. And she's all wrong or he's all wrong. And I know that they're wrong because I did this and I did that. And I have this and I have a mind to know. what well, God gave me the wisdom to know how to use the mind he gave me. Did he now? He tells you right in the word that in your wisdom, you didn't know God and you didn't want God. And therefore he brought forth the foolishness of preaching the cross to confound the wise. He brought it to confound you. Go look up what the word confound means. He wants to bring you to your knees as a little child, like he said. But, oh, you're a woman. You're a man. You don't need none of that because you're full grown. No, 
children know. That is not the way it goes. I'm going to hope to go into the next video because this one, I think, is getting a bit long about the two different ways to pray.